Good morning. Uh, welcome to the Horsons uh, Spring Tax Update. Uh, my name is Aaron Hemmington. Uh, today I'm joined by my colleagues uh, Craig Walker and Stephen Charles and we're going to talk you through the various tax changes that were set out in the budget and uh, how they affect businesses and individuals. Um, we'll be holding a Q&A session at the end um, and in that regard if I could ask you to enter any questions you've got in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and then um, we'll endeavour to answer your questions at the end. The next slide please Rob. <clears throat> Next one, okay. For those of the, you that are new to Horsons, uh, we're a leading independent firm of accountants and business advisors, offices in Sheffield, uh, Doncaster and Northampton, uh, member of an international network called HLB, which is in the top 10 of international networks. Uh, and we've got a strong focus on advisory services, <clears throat> including tax and corporate finance. Okay, so today <clears throat> I'll be talking about business tax um, Craig's going to talk about VAT and personal tax and Stephen's going to talk about SDLT uh, and employment tax. I think it's fair to say that there was a quite big build up to this budget. Um, a lot of people are expecting changes to capital gains tax and running around trying to get deals done beforehand. Um, ultimately, as you'll see from this presentation, there were hardly any changes to CGT and the CGT slide is probably the shortest of them all in this session. Uh, next slide please, Rob. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm gonna kick off with a uh, business tax. Uh, so first of all, um, good news for self-employed uh, people in that the uh, self-employed income support scheme has been extended and uh, the government have announced grants four and five. The fourth grant is gonna cover the months February to April 21 um, and people can claim it from late April 21. It's gonna be calculated in a similar fashion to um, the previous grants in that it's gonna be 80% of three months average trading profits subject to a 7,500 uh, 7, uh, cap. Uh, just to be clear that this isn't available if you know, you've had average trading profits over the last three years of, of more than 50,000. Um, this time you need to have filed a 2019-20 uh, tax return prior to the 3rd of March 21. Um, and that's actually good news for newly self-employed people because it means that people that were newly self-employed from April 19 um, now qualify for this grant, whereas before they didn't. Um, the fifth grant has also been announced uh, to cover the months from May to September 21, which can be claimed from late July. Uh, the way this is calculated is going to be different. It's going to be subject to a turnover test. Uh, so if your turnover has fallen by less than 30%, uh, you, <clears throat> you can receive uh, just a 30% grant, and that's going to be capped at a payment of 2,850. Okay, moving on to restart grants, I and mean, these have been brought in to support uh, the recovery of, of the high street as, as the trading restrictions are relaxed. It's basically going to provide a, a grant of up to 18,000 per premises for hospitality, leisure, uh, personal care and gym type businesses, and uh, a grant of up to 6,000 uh, for non-essential retail. So, so a bit of good news there for the high street. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Okay, moving on to corporation tax. Um, I think everyone was expecting there was going to be a rise in corporation tax, but I'm not sure people were expecting that we we're going to get the biggest rise to corporation tax since 1974. Um, <clears throat> so this table here just sets out uh, the changes. The changes won't come into effect until April 23. Um, and when they do come into effect, uh, really small companies with profits up to 50,000 will still continue to benefit from the 19% rate. But we're now going to have this main rate of 25% uh, for companies that have got profits over £250,000. Um, and for companies that have got profits uh, sitting in the bracket 50000 to 250000 they're going to pay uh, at the main rate of 25% less, uh, less marginal relief. Um, and in this regard, we're going to have a return of the old associated company rule. So that means that all these limits are going to be divided by one plus the number of associated companies. Um, and very broadly, an associate, associated companies are companies that are under the control of the same persons or persons. So if you've got associated companies, then these high rates of corporation tax are going to kick in at, at lower levels of profit. The next slide, please. Um, and just looking at the impact of the increase in the CT rate on, on remuneration planning, Actually, um, if you just isolate the profits that fall in the 50,000 to 250,000 range, 
actually the effective tax rate on those profits is 26.5%. Now I think people are going to have to revisit their remuneration planning and profit extraction uh, strat strategies because you know, up until now, you know, dividends have been the most tax efficient way of, of taking your profits out. But now it's going to shift perhaps towards a balance uh, balancing act. So there could be a mixture of bonuses and, and salaries in order to optimise um, the, the tax position. Um, and again, it's going to have to be looked at on, on, on a case by case basis. But we would sort of urge people to start thinking about this now um, in order to get the, the, the appropriate strategy in place. And of course, we're happy to talk to people about, about that if they want to. Next slide, please. Okay, so we've had some good news with regards to uh, trading losses um, with an extension to the carryback rules. Um, we, usually you can have an unlimited carryback um, to the previous year, um, but you don't normally get a carryback uh, beyond that um, unless you're a sole trader or partner in the early years of a business or you've got terminal losses on cessation. So what these, what these rules have done is effectively extended the loss carryback period from one year to three years uh, for accounting periods ending between April 20 and March 22 for companies and for unincorporated businesses uh, for the tax years ended 5th of April 21 and 5th of April 22. So in effect, it's going to enable a refund of tax paid uh, pre-COVID. So the way this is going to work is uh, we're going to continue to have an unlimited uh, carry back of trading losses to the prior year. But if we've still got any trading losses left after that, um, then we can go back to the previous two years. However, uh, a two million pound cap does apply in respect of any carry back uh, to those earlier two years. And also um, the two million cap applies on a group wide basis. So if you've got a, a group of companies, that, that two million pound cap applies across the group. But I think it's, it's, it's definitely good news given, given you know, the current climate that there's more scope to, to carry losses back and, and get some um, tax refunds where possible. Um, next slide, please. Okay, <clears throat> definitely one of the bigger uh, sound bites from, from the budget was the, uh, the super deduction. Um, now this is a capital allowance, um, which gives you uh, 130% uh, deduction um, in respect of uh, expenditure on qualifying uh, plants and machinery or a 50% first year relief uh, for special rate uh, plant and machinery. Now just just to be clear the um, special rate plant and machinery is basically integral features which is things like um, you know electrical systems, heating systems, water systems, lighting systems. Basically, um, for the 130% relief, you're effectively going to get a 25p tax cut for every one pound spent, and there's no spending cap on that. Just to be clear, also that this relief only applies to companies. Okay, um, there are the usual sort of exclusions, so you can't claim it on uh, used assets, you can't claim it on cars or assets for leasing, and also you can't claim it on assets acquired from connected parties. Okay. Um, and it only applies for capital expenditure that's been incurred between 1st of April 21 and 31st of March 23. There are also some special clawback rules when the asset is sold. So if you actually sell um, an asset that you've claimed the super deduction on before uh, March, the end of March 23, you have to bring in um, the disposal proceeds as a balancing charge, which is added to your profits chargeable to corporation tax. However, the amount of balance and charge you bring in is actually 130% of the proceeds, okay? Um, if you sell the asset in a period that straddles 1st of April 23, there's a special apportionment um, to determine how much uh, proceeds that you bring in, okay? Okay, next slide, please. Um, alongside this, we've still got uh, the annual investment allowance. And that, that provides a 100% uh, capital allowance, a 100% write-off in, in the year of acquisition of qualifying plant and machinery, currently up to a threshold of £1 million. And that threshold has been extended to 31st of December 21. 
but it is due to reduce down to the standard 200,000 from the 1st of January 2022. But it could be extended again, we just don't know at the moment. Um, and so given this fact that we've now got the super deduction and the annual investment allowance, um, one of the big questions um, that people are asking is, you know, should companies ex accelerate expenditure so it falls in the period from April 21 to March 23? in order to benefit from the super deduction. Now, it's not necessarily going to be beneficial to do that. And it all depends on, you know, the amount of expenditure you're planning on incurring over the next few years. Because if, if you're only planning on spending, you know, within the available annual investment allowance, um, yeah, you could bring the expenditure forward now and get an effective uh, rate of relief of 25%, as we've said um, earlier. But if you, don't bring the expenditure forward and you just decide that you're just going to wait until 2023 and you just incur it within the annual investment allowance. Well, as we've seen earlier, the uh, corporation tax rate is actually going up to 25%. So the annual investment allowance is actually going to be worth more. Um, so you're still going to, have, it's going to be worth 25% effective rate in effect. So yeah, in effect, by delaying expenditure until then, you're not necessarily going to be any worse off because 100% annual investment allowance at 25%, it's 25% um, effective rate of relief. So, so some companies are not necessarily going to be better off is, is the bottom line, um, but other companies will be, especially companies that are planning on, on spending a lot over the next few years. And really, I think it's just a case of sort of doing a detailed analysis of firstly, you know, what sort of plant and machine are you looking at buying? You know, what sort of rate are you going to get on it? Are you going to get the 130%? Are you going to get the 50%? What about the annual investment allowance? Uh, look at the timing and just look at available cash and finances and, and just try and decide what, what is the best strategy to go for there. Okay. Now moving on to free ports. Now this is a new scheme uh, that's been brought in to stimulate inward investment and a number of free port sites have been designated in England which are East Midlands Airport, uh, Felixstone, Harwich, the Humber region, Liverpool City region, uh, Plymouth, the Solent, uh, Thames and Teesside. Basically, uh, under this measure, businesses will be able to claim reliefs from certain key business taxes uh, within the bounds of a free port. Um, so briefly, the, the proposals include uh, SDLT relief for land bought within you know, a free port site, enhanced structures and buildings allowance, um, so looking at getting a 10% rate instead of free, um, enhanced capital allowances, um, on certain qualifying plant and machinery that's purchased uh, for use within free port sites. Also, employer national insurance uh, rate relief and business rates relief as well. So that all sounds quite generous <clears throat> and uh, it's good news. Okay, uh, moving on to R&D uh, tax relief, the new cap on the R&D tax credit. Uh, this is not something that was actually announced in the budget. We, we didn't know about this before. Um, but just to confirm that this new cap on the R&D tax credit is coming in uh, from the 1st of April. Um, and basically uh, R&D tax credits will be capped such that they're limited to 20,000 plus three times the amount of the company's PAYE and NIC liability. However, this won't apply to all companies. It won't apply uh, provided that um, expenditure um, in respect of connected subcontractors or externally provided workers is not more than 15% of your qualifying expenditure and the company is creating relevant intellectual property or performing a significant amount of management activity into, in relation to relevant um, IP. So it's not going not to catch all companies, uh, which is good news. Okay. Also on, on the R&D front, uh, the government have announced a wide ranging review of R&D tax reliefs. Um, so they're going to look at additional types of expenditure, um, which may be brought into the legislation as qualifying, um, which could be good news there if we've got more types of expenditure we can claim the relief on. We're also looking at the way the relief is given uh, by combining the SME and RDEX schemes. Well, that's certainly going to be a big change. Um, I'm going to watch that one with interest, to be honest. Um, they're also looking at restricting uh, relief to R&D carried out in the UK. Going to look at administration and, and the role of uh, R&D boutiques, uh, support and development of green technologies, and uh, again looking at including expenditure on cloud computing and, and data systems. 
that just wraps up uh, my section. Again, if you've got any questions on any of those items, uh, please feel free to enter them into the Q&A. But now I'm going to hand over to Molly, my colleague, Craig, who's going to talk about VAT and personal tax. Come on, Craig. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so, yeah, as, as Aaron mentioned, I'm, I'm firstly going to speak about VAT um, and look at some of the recent announcements to VAT. Um, and then I'm going to move on to uh, tax changes affecting you personally, looking at personal tax changes. Uh, so first of all, in terms of VAT, uh, you may recall that last summer the government introduced a temporary 5% uh, rate of VAT. Um, this, this was um, for certain supplies uh, made by businesses in the hospitality and tourism sectors. So th th this was aimed at really trying to help out the businesses um, that have been hard hit by, by the pandemic, uh, those in the hospitality sectors and, uh, and tourism. Um, and, and that was originally meant to finish in September last year. Um, that was extended to March 21. Um, and then in the budget, the Chancellor has actually extended that again through to September um, 21 of this year. So, so we, we've had this relief for a while now. Um, and it, and um, clearly a very valuable relief uh, to, uh, in, to businesses in those sectors. Um, what, what I think the Chancellor was keen to avoid is, is a, a cliff edge um, happening once, once this relief came to an end. So uh, he did announce that from October, the, the rate will be changing from 5% to 12.5%, but just, just to try and avoid that cliff edge and, and just help businesses um, manage the transition back to the standard rate uh, of 20%. So that, that, that was quite widely covered uh, after the budget. Uh, perhaps something that has had less publicity is the domestic reverse charge for the construction sector. So this is quite a significant change for those businesses in the construction industry. And this actually came into effect on the 1st of March uh, this year. So it, it's now uh, in play. Um, so, so what's this all about? So in, in a nutshell, the reverse charge is, is where the recipient of the supply um, charges themselves the VAT and, and pays that over to HMRC rather than what normally happens where the supplier charges VAT and, and pays that over. Um, so I so say th this affects people in the construction industry, so it won't a a a apply to, uh, to too many businesses. It, it is a certain sector. Um, and the idea behind this is that I think the, the government were concerned that suppliers were disappearing without paying uh, the VAT to HMRC. So the idea was that by, by um, asking the, the recipient of the supply to pay the VAT, uh, that would lead to, 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 to more of that being collected. So the amount of VAT that's payable isn't changing. It's, it's merely um, a case of the, the person who's paying over the VAT is changing. So that's quite an interesting change that, that, that uh, so came into effect on the 1st of March uh, this year. Uh, next slide, please, Rob. So you may remember that, that last year, businesses were given the opportunity to defer VAT um, that was that that was due between the 20th of March and the 30th of June last year. Um, and unsurprisingly, lots of businesses decided to do that. Uh, I understand over 600,000 businesses actually deferred their VAT. Um, so clearly th this is just a deferment. It's not a cancellation of the VAT. So I just wanted to flag up really that um, th th this is something that you need to be um, uh, thinking about now, you, you, need, you need to be either paying that that deferred VAT by the end of this month, uh, or actually um, arranging to, to pay it over a delayed period with with HMRC. Uh, so it is important that action is, is taken now if, if you haven't already settled that deferred VAT. And the government announced last month that you would be able to pay um, the deferred VAT in 11 monthly instalments. Um, so that so that that came in fairly recently. And the, the, the beauty of that is that uh, no interest will be charged on the monthly instalments. Um, so certainly take advantage of, of that if you would prefer to, to, to spread the payments. Or alternatively, the um, HMRC uh, say, give them a call and, and try to agree an alternative payment plan with them. So yeah, just, just to flag that up really, if, if you haven't already 
uh, paid the deferred VAT, then uh, you, you do need to take action now. If, if you don't do that, then, then there is a potential penalty of 5% of the deferred VAT. So clearly we want to avoid, avoid any, any penalties for late payment. Um, so in the, in the budget, um, the, the Chancellor announced that the VAT threshold would remain 85,000. Um, it's actually been at 85,000 for four years already. Um, and it's going to stay stay at 85,000 until March 23. Um, so as with lots of things in VAT, the, the, the rates very, very infrequently change. They, they tend to stay the same for a number of years. Um, and that's what's happening here. So, so the VAT registration threshold will remain at 85,000 and the deregistration threshold will remain at 83,000. So clearly there'll be lots of businesses operating just under the VAT threshold, just under the 85,000. Um, so I think there's, um, I know, I know the, the Chancellor's faced some criticism for, for this move, for, for keeping it at 85,000, because obviously freezing the allowance um, creates a disincentive to actually grow your business. There's many businesses are reluctant to, to go over the 85,000 um, and, and, and fall, fall within the, the VAT rules. Um, but uh, but we, we've now got that clarity, it's going to remain at that rate for a number of years now. Next slide, please, Rob. So this is something that um, we came came in during uh, sorry came in through the small print of the budget really it, it wasn't really mentioned by the chancellor. Um, this is making tax digital for VAT. So this came in a few years ago now, uh, but it's actually been extended uh, from first of April twenty two uh, for all VAT registered businesses. So at the moment it only applies to VAT registered businesses with taxable turnover above eighty five thousand above the, the VAT threshold, um, but it will be extended to all VAT registered businesses um, in a year's time. So uh, it is important that if you fall within this category, you actually start to plan now for this change. Um, so we, you've got 12 months to, to do some planning. Uh, so what does it mean? What is making tax digital? Uh, so it basically means that, that the business will need to keep their VAT records in a digital format. Um, which they may be doing already, or they may not. And also there's a requirement to, sub to submit their VAT return information uh, via what's called MTD compatible software. So, so you may need to purchase some new software in order to, uh, to comply with these, these rules. Uh, so HMRC seem to be uh, plowing on full steam ahead with, with making TAT digital. That, that's, that's quite clear, I think, from this budget. And another, another big change uh, that, that came in in the budget is uh, a change to the penalty regime. Again, this, this didn't make the headlines, that this was in the small print. And this, this, will, um, this will affect the, the penalty regime for both VAT and income tax going forward. The government was keen to have just one penalty regime across both taxes. So, so that's what it's, what it's done here with, with this, new, uh, this new regime. So we're now moving to a, a points-based system so, so what's that mean? What's a points-based system? Um, so I think it was Bruce Forsyth, Bruce Forsyth that said that uh, points make prizes. Well, in, in this case, points make penalties. So you, you don't want to accumulate penalties. So you don't want to accumulate points because that leads to penalties. Um, so obviously you, you want to avoid returns going in late and avoid any, uh, any late payments of, of, of tax. Um, so that's, that's coming in from April 22. Um, and then the following year, in April 23, that will be uh, coming into effect for income tax purposes. So certainly something to be aware of um, going forward. Right, so we now move on to the tax changes that will affect you personally. Uh, so uh, these are the most interesting ones, right? These, these are the ones that affect us personally. So um, I'm, I'm sure you, you're all aware that um, that the personal allowance um, is being frozen from this next year for, for, for a five year period. Um, it's actually going up before it's been frozen. So, it's a, there will be a small increase of, of 70 pounds in the personal allowance from April 21, but then it will remain, it will remain at that rate for, for a five year period. Um, we actually knew this last year. It was announced last year that, that the rate will be going up in April. Um, so, so it, it wasn't really big news in the budget, uh, but the, the, the Chancellor did confirm that that would take place. 
I think the, the freezing for five years was, was more of a surprise. Uh, and, and clearly that will mean that um, more basic rate taxpayers will potentially fall within the higher rate tax bracket um, and obviously increase, increase the, uh, sorry, sorry. Um, I'm skipping ahead. I'm skipping ahead to the high rate tax threshold. The high rate tax threshold is increasing as well to to, to fifty thousand two hundred and seventy. Uh, so sorry that that will that will mean that um, um, and and then being frozen for five years. So that that will mean that more people will potentially be in the high rate tax bracket. Um, in terms of national insurance thresholds, uh, they are they are being changed to mirror the the new high rate tax threshold for income tax. So everything's been aligned there. Uh, so, so, uh, so that that is going to lead to obviously a big increase in tax take for HMRC. Um, the government, I think, were very keen to keep to their manifesto promise of not increasing tax rates. So they've they've done that. They've not increased the rate of income tax, um, but they found a way of actually increasing the amount of of, of tax take from the taxpayer. So they, they've managed that that balancing act. And I think the chancellor was was quite. Um, open about this, about the, about the, uh, the freezers. Um, he, he didn't try to hide that at all. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, there will be a new penalty regime for VAT and income tax, um, just in terms of the dates when this comes in. So for VAT purposes, it's coming in in April 22. For income tax purposes, it's coming in a little later, April 23 initially. Um, and that will be for uh, for individuals with business or property income above ten thousand pounds. And then the following year, April twenty four, it will be coming in for everyone, uh, regardless of, of levels of income. Uh, so as I say, that's that's a, a points based system going forward. Um, and and uh, the, the the next point uh, is regarding making tax digital. So um, it had all gone fairly quiet, really, in terms of making tax digital for income tax. Obviously, it, it, it's, um, it's been around for a few years now for VAT, but uh, uh, it's quite clear that the government are pushing ahead with this for income tax purposes as well. Um, so we, we now know that from April 23, if you, if, you, if you have business income or property income above £10,000, then you will fall within making tax digital for income tax. Um, so what's that mean? What's that mean for you? Uh, well, like with... Like with MTD for VAT, you'll be required to keep your records in a digital format uh, rather, rather than a paper format. Um, and also you'll be required to file quarterly returns with HMRC. They don't call them returns, they call them updates, but it, it is in effect a return. So, you, so there'll be uh, quarterly returns to submit. Um, and then at the end of the tax year, there is a, another return to, to, to submit, which is called an annual declaration. So effectively, you've got five submissions during the year rather than just the one tax return. So that, that's the system that we're looking at going forward from, from April 23. So quite a significant change, really, to the, to the existing uh, system. Next slide, please, Rob. So capital gains tax. Um, there was a lot of speculation prior to the budget that, uh, that the rates of capital gains tax uh, might go up. Um, and uh, I know that we were busy prior to budget dates trying to get deals through, um, obviously, before budget date, before any increase. Um, but, but there was nothing in, in the budget uh, about this at all. There, there were no, no changes uh, announced, no increases in, in uh, CGT rates, no changes to CGT reliefs. Um, so, um, yeah, it was a bit of a surprise for us. But... Uh, I think it's a case of watching this space because um, I think it's likely in, in the not too distant future that we could well see increases in, in the tax rates. Uh, obviously, the, the CGT rates are uh, significantly less than the income tax rates, um, so we we could see that uh, we could see the chance to look to align align the rates for income tax and CGT. It's not happened yet, but it could well happen in in the near future, um, perhaps as early as next year. That there might be some change there. So yeah, watch this space. Um, obviously, if, if you are considering um, disposing of an asset uh, in the not too distant future, then uh, you might want to do so sooner rather than later to try and to try and bank these low rates of CGT. Um, 
just also I want to mention about entrepreneurs relief uh, so the lifetime limit for entrepreneurs relief was cut last year down to one million pounds um, so it's important really that uh, if, if you own shares in a company that you, you, you maybe consider spreading those shares across the across your family so giving perhaps some of those shares to a family member in order to to bank more than one lifetime limit uh, in order to bank more than more than one one million pound exemption so there's, there's definitely scope for some tax planning there um, and uh, obviously it's important that you meet the conditions as well for entrepreneurs relief because that is a, is a very generous relief um, providing a, a tax rate of just 10 percent so no no real change to well no change at all to the CGT rates and reliefs the only the only real tweak um, well the only real announcement was in terms of the annual exemption uh, that's been frozen at 12,300 um, for the next five years so uh, again another another freeze another allowance that's frozen that seemed to be a, a theme in the budget and I just wanted to mention about the the 30 day rule uh, for, for sales of UK residential property this didn't come in in the budget this was actually announced last year uh, but I don't think I don't think many people are aware of this and, and I wouldn't want you to fall foul of this so uh, just just a reminder that if you dispose of a UK residential property uh, then you have you have only 30 days to report that disposal to HMRC and pay any tax that's due. So yeah, only 30 days to do that. Um, other, otherwise you face penalties. Um, and ju I just want to flag up that if there's no gain at all, if you made a loss on the property um, or, um, or if the gain is covered by your annual exemption, there's no requirement to file within 30 days. It's only if, if, there's, a, uh, if there's tax due effectively. So yeah, that's certainly something to watch out for. So moving on to the other taxes, um, and in particular inheritance tax. There were no real changes in the budget in relation to inheritance tax. Uh, the, the only real thing of note is that the inheritance tax thresholds were frozen for another five years. So the nil rate band uh, will be 325,000 for another five years until April 26. It's actually been that rate since, sorry, that, that, it's been that amount since April 2009. So we've already had a number of years at, at, at this amount. And uh, uh, obviously in this period, house prices will have, will have shot up. So more and more people are potentially falling within the IHT net. Um, and, and, and that's going to be the case going forward over these next five years as hopefully property prices continue to rise. Um, more people will potentially be, be paying inheritance tax. So clearly the, 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 um, the, the benefits of, of receiving um, IHT advice and doing some IHT planning become more valuable um, if you're falling within this category. But, but no changes to the, to the rules really relating to inheritance tax. And with regard to pensions, um, there was some speculation before the budget that the Chancellor might tinker with the tax relief scheme for pension contributions. That didn't happen. Uh, I think there was, there, was a, um, there was lots of speculation that he might um, reduce the amount of relief that high rate taxpayers receive for pension contributions, but, uh, but no, no sign of that in the budget. The one thing he did do is, is freeze the lifetime limit, the pensions lifetime limit um, for another five years so um, yeah, that, that, that's the only real change to, uh, to pensions. So I'll now, now hand over to Stephen, uh, who will uh, provide an update on, on some of the recent changes to stamp duty. Thank you, Craig, and thank you to everyone for joining us this morning. Uh, very good number of uh, participants, that's really good. So thank you for giving up the time. Uh, so yeah, I'm just going to quickly run through some issues on stamp duty and some employment tax issues probably the shortest section so you'd be relieved uh, by that. Um, we just had someone ask about VAT and domestic reverse charge. Um, that's quite a specialist area so if you are interested in that area then I suggest you talk to our VAT consultant uh, Tony Nixon. Um, his email is tn at horsons.co.uk um, and he's spent a lot of time with the revenue before joining us so he's pretty experienced on all things VAT related be very happy to have a chat with you about that 
Um, so moving on to stamp duty, as I think everyone is probably aware, we've currently got a stamp duty land tax holiday. Um, it basically increases the threshold for residential property from 125,000 up to 500,000. So it's a very generous relief. I was quite surprised at quite high how high they'd set the threshold temporarily because that can save up to £15,000 if you're buying a property of um, that sort of magnitude. So just on a little table there, with a £600,000 purchase price, you're currently saving £15,000 of stamp duty. So the more you, up to £500,000, the more you spend, the more you save. So um, it does um, benefit the high value purchases more substantially. So that holiday has been extended for a further three months till the end of June, um, which I think is a big relief to conveyancing solicitors who are very busy trying to get everything done by the end of March, but I guess it'll just mean they're really busy at the end of June now as well. Um, and then it's going to come down on a tapered uh, mechanism, so down to 250000 for three months and then back to 125000 from the end of September. So you can see in that period between July and September, the savings um, are going to be quite a lot smaller, just two and a half grand. Next slide. Thank you, Rob. I should have just mentioned that, that holiday only relates to residential property. So always in the past, it's been cheaper in terms of stamp duty to buy commercial or mixed use property. But currently with a stamp duty holiday, that's not always true. Um, sometimes it's actually cheaper if it's purely residential, which is a little bit counterintuitive. So with the very high rates of stamp duty on residential properties, normally lots of people have been trying to classify property as mixed use. Um, and this has been filtering through into tribunals and tax cases. Um, Particularly common, I think, is where people have bought a property with a little bit of land, maybe a paddock at the back uh, with a horse grazing on it, um, perhaps, and a, maybe an old barn or something like that. And then they said, well, that's mixed use. Revenue are very much saying, no, it's not, it's just residential. Uh, and the tribunals have been coming down on the side of HMRC. Um, that doesn't mean there isn't any scope for claiming mixed use, but I think it's got to be genuine mixed use. So if you buy a farm, for example, with a farmhouse and a substantial amount of land, that's mixed use. There's no apportionment, you just apply the um, commercial rate of stamp duty. So certainly if you're buying a property, it is something to bear in mind. Um, you know, there might be a building which could be used as an office, if you convert if you sort of convert it into an office, uh, which are used for genuine business purposes. Um, and you have sort of staff working in that office, then perhaps it might be um, arguable that it's a mixed use property. But if it's just an office which you use for your own family use, work, they're working from home, then I think you're, you're not gonna succeed there. Another big area is multiple dwellings relief. Um, so this is basically saying if you buy a number of residential properties together, normally you pay the stamp duty on the full amount of the proceeds. But with the multiple dwellings relief claim, and it's a claim you have to make, um, you can average the value of the properties and pay the stamp duty on the average value. That can save substantial amounts of money and does quite often get missed. So it is a, a key issue to look at. Um, it can help with um, buying substantial properties which perhaps have a self-contained granny annex, for example. You might be able to use a multiple dwellings relief there. Seen it recently on a case where someone bought a building with um, ground floors commercial, a shop front, and then two apartments above it. That was a multiple dwellings relief claim and it substantially reduced um, the stamp duty liability. Um, and if it's got some commercial in it, then you don't even have to pay the 3% surcharge following a, a recent case. So um, that is kind of the ideal transaction, a mixed use property with multiple dwellings. That is kind of the ideal purchase, really, from a stamp duty perspective. So the government's also brought in a 2% surcharge on non-residents buying residential property. I think it's probably driven by a lot of London apartments and so on being purchased offshore um, and then not really being lived in, just being purchased as investments. 
So there's a 2% surcharge on that on top. Um, it not only applies to non-residents, it also applies to UK companies which are controlled by non-residents. So you can think an easy way around, it would have been for a non-resident to set up a UK company to make the purchase, but unfortunately that is still cool. Next slide please, Rob. And again, thank you. So just some announcements in the budget about the furlough scheme, or to give it its proper name, the job retention scheme. It's been extended to the 30th of June uh, at, at its current um, conditions um, and amounts, and then on a slightly less generous basis to the end of September. So the employer will be expected to start contributing for those months, July, August, and September. Uh, a bit of a surprise, really. It's been extended so long. I was expecting us to um, probably go when things open up, hopefully, uh, towards the end of June. But there it is. The employer, employee has to be on the payroll at some point during um, the last year as well. So there's a little bit of a dispensation there around testing that uh, there's not going to be um, of anything kind. Uh, regarding that, it probably hadn't really occurred to most people that there could be, but uh, the government has made that clear, so that's good news. Next slide, please. So we've got a special exemption for employers purchasing equipment for employees working from home. So things like laptops would be the obvious example, or maybe office chair or something like that. Um, so it's got to be made available generally to employees and for that sole purpose of working from home. And they've got to be able to demonstrate that uh, private use is insignificant, really. Now, it's important the employer incurs the expenditure because if the employee incurs the expenditure, you do have a, have a problem because the benefit, uh, exemption doesn't necessarily apply. So you do need to get it the right way around the employer um, actually acquires the equipment. Thank you, Rob. Next slide. So just a little bit of tinkering around really. So the EMI share option scheme, which is a very generous share option scheme, uh, tax advantage share option scheme for SMEs, uh, does require the option holder to work at least 25 hours a week uh, or at least 75% of their working time for the employer. Now, obviously with the furlough arrangements, that might not have happened. So the government doesn't want the option to lack simply because of the furlough. So they have granted a relaxation for the current year and the previous tax year. They are consulting on the EMI scheme. I mean, it is, as I say, a very generous scheme, uh, and this might be a really good time to look at implementing a scheme because um, the value of the shares in the company may be affected by COVID, may be reduced, and therefore you can be um, grant more shares to employees without uh, incurring tax problems. So, it might be time to start thinking about that. Cycle to work scheme has also been a relaxation there as well. So next slide, please. Thank you. So the budget gave some reliefs for company vans. Um, so zero emission van will not trigger a taxable benefit in kind. So we are seeing more of those type of vehicles coming on. To the market so that is something worth considering we see i see some driving around sheffield as well uh, so definitely something maybe worth exploring the normal van benefit is three and a half thousand pounds in comparison now there have been some issues around uh, company vans um hmrc were successful in the coca-cola case in the court of appeal uh, coca-cola could appeal that i understand uh, but we don't really know if that will be appealed or not yet so that was a combi van, uh, the Vauxhall Combi, and the sorry, Volkswagen Combi and the Vauxhall Vivaro. So the revenue said they are not commercial vehicles, uh, which was a bit of a surprise, really. Uh, they do have a second row seats, which can be removed, and I think they have windows in the back as well, generally. So you do need to be careful if you are using that type of van. I mean, that could also, although that was a benefit in kind case, it could have implications for capital allowances. Um, we get a lot of questions about whether commercial vehicles qualify for the super deduction. Well, a commercial vehicle does qualify, 
Uh, so vans, noise, trucks, etc. The cars don't. But is there, could the revenue start claiming that some commercial vehicles such as uh, combi vans are actually uh, cars for capital houses? I don't know, possible. So not only a benefit kind issue, there's a potential capital houses issue as well. Uh, I mean, electric cars, zero emission cars should qualify for 100% first year allowance, even though they don't qualify for the super deduction. Uh, or the annual investment allowance. So it's quite a complicated area, electric cars and vans. Next slide, please, Bob. So, over the last few years, there's been quite a few changes around IR35. Um, 2017, public sector was a big change. Uh, public sector contractors had to um, review the status of their subcontractors, and that's was supposed to come in last year for large and medium sized businesses in the private sector. That was delayed a year, so it is coming in in a couple of weeks time. So that means that large and medium businesses have to look at their subcontractors and work out whether they're actually off payroll workers, in which case they need to uh, deduct tax and national insurance. Uh, they need to Review the, review the status, they need to notify the subcontractor and then give the subcontractor opportunity to come back um, and uh, disagree with that position. So there is quite a lot of uh, administration to do, even if you do think all your subcontractors are genuine subcontractors. So something hopefully most people are on with, but uh, if not, you need to really get on with that sooner rather than later. Um, just on these, exemption for small businesses you do need to be careful for that it's you do need to look at the group so if you're a small company but part of a large group or you've got a large parent company you are going to be caught so uh, do take care about that um, yeah thank you for that uh, just to say really we do have some tax consultations being issued later this month next week should be released 23rd of march uh, from the revenue so hopefully they won't trigger any immediate tax changes but they will demonstrate where the revenue are thinking of going so things like capital gains tax inheritance tax maybe there might be some changes which are announced to come in um, down the track so thank you very much for listening you're very welcome to ask us any questions outside this seminar we've got our contact details there but uh, I don't know um, Fellow panelists, have we got any questions we need to pick up um, now? There's one question from uh, Ian Kelly. Um, if you've incorporated during the pandemic and have received various grants, loans, business rates, relief, etc., are there any clawback rules? Now, obviously, there's clawback rules for the self employed income support scheme and furlough grants, aren't there? <clears throat> if it's found that you didn't initially qualify. Um, I don't know of any clawback if you mm -hmm. sort of, apart from, you know, if you claimed it incorrectly yeah. um, in the first yeah. place. I'm not sure of anything else yeah. um, around that. Mm. I'm not aware of anything else. Mm. No. We did have a few questions about vehicles. Um, yeah, so as Aaron said, cars unfortunately don't qualify for the um, super deduction or the annual investment allowance. Um, so they're just going to the pool um, for commercial vehicles. Should benefit as long as you incur the expense during the correct periods. Um, mm. All right. Well, well thank you very much for giving up your time this morning, your attention. Um, we do appreciate that. So yeah, if you've got any questions, just you know come back to us um definitely by all means. So thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Cheers.